a todos. Só um minutinho aqui. Bom, boa tarde. Queria agradecer novamente a presença de vocês a presença de vocês no Tiaços, hoje com a presença muito especial do nosso colega Paul Bishop. Paul, seja muito bem-vindo ao nosso Tiaços, nosso encontro brasileiro de psicologia junguiana. Vou fazer primeiro a apresentação formal, Paul, tá bem? Paul Bishop, que vai falar para a gente hoje como levar uma vida ideal com Goethe, Schiller e Jung. Paul Bishop é William Jacks Chair de Linguagens Modernas na Universidade de Glasgow. Está interessado nas conexões entre a tradição literária alemã e a história da psicanálise e da psicologia analítica. Uh, autor de vários livros, eu vou fazer o seguinte, eu vou mostrar alguns livros, Paul, seus, tá? Uh, Reading Get At Midlife, um livro que tem muito a ver com o que a gente vai discutir hoje, um livro editado pelo Paul Bishop, o Arcaico, o Passado no Presente, outro livro editado pelo Paul, o Estático e o Arcaico, uma investigação na psicologia analítica, esse livro que é um dos meus preferidos, Paul, On the Blissful Island. Mitch e Jung, Analytical Psychology and German Classic Aesthetics, Goethe, Schiller e Jung, em dois volumes, tá? Dois volumes. Um que eu só consegui mimeografado, <risos> o Self Dionisíaco, Recepção em Jung, de Friedrich Nietzsche. E uma pequena biografia, mas muito interessante, uma perspectiva muito própria, que eu gostei bastante de ler também, sobre Jung, do Paul Bishop. Paul, um prazer te receber. É, queria te contar uma pequena história antes da gente começar. Quando a gente começou a, a planejar os é, eu conversando com um amigo meu, que provavelmente está aqui, Maurício Santos, que é um psiquiatra e analista junguiano em formação, ele me fez uma pergunta, que é, mas você vai chamar o Paul Bishop, né? Você vai convidá-lo, não vai? Então, é curioso que, desde o início, o seu nome já estava presente como um dos mais queridos e mais esperados convidados para o nosso teatro. E chegou a hora, chegou a sua vez. Sinta-se à vontade, é um prazer imenso te receber, é uma grande alegria para mim Sou um leitor teu de muitos e muitos anos e ter você aqui pessoalmente, online, mas pessoalmente conosco, é uma grande alegria, uma grande honra para todos nós. Obrigado pela tua presença. Well, thank you, thank you very much, Marcus, for those uh, very kind, two kind words. Um, it, it, it's great to be with you. Um, it, it, it's great to be with everybody, um, it, it just shows looking at those books, um, how Jung keeps on drawing me back in time and time again. I try to get away, but I can't. Um, and after all, um, when one sees how important he is as a thinker, one thinks one's chosen wisely if one sticks with him. Um, I, I'm, I'm delighted to be here um, virtually over Zoom with you. And, and what I really wanted to do was to, to share some material with you um, by Goethe and Schiller and, um, and to do it as a kind of experiment where, where we're going to do it very simply. Um, of course, the texts are in German. I've, I've given you some translations in English. Um, uh, you've got the texts in English. Um, very kindly, some Portuguese versions have been found. Um, I've got the texts. Um, and what I'd really like for us to do is to read them together. Um, and I think that if we approach them in the way that I'm gonna suggest, we can understand why Goethe and Schiller were so important for Jung. 
And if we want to understand Jung better, then we need to understand Goethe and Schiller better as well. It's a mutual engagement between these two sets of authors. And just to remind ourselves how important Goethe was for Jung, remember what he says about Faust in Memories, Dreams, Reflections. He talks about in his youth in the 1890s, how he was caught up in what he calls the spirit of the age. And he says, Faust struck a chord in me. It pierced me through in a way I could not but regard as personal. So when we're reading texts by Goethe, we're reading texts that were very, very personal for Jung. He says, it awakened me the problem of opposites, good and evil, mind and matter, light and darkness. He says, these are Jung words, my own inner contradictions appeared here in dramatized form in the figure of Faust and Mephistopheles. He says, Goethe had written virtually a basic outline and pattern of my own conflicts and solutions. So if we think about that, when we read these texts, I know one was by Schiller, I'll say something about that, but these texts, think about them, what they would have meant for Jung. And it's interesting that Jung summarizes the project of analytical psychology precisely with reference to Goethe and to Faust. Jung says this, he says, I consciously linked my work to what Faust had passed over. One, respect for the eternal rights of humankind. So for human rights, there's a political project here. Second, recognition of the ancient or the archaic, another name for it, where we come from in order that we know where we're going. And third, continuity of culture and intellectual history. And what I want us to do this evening is to experience that sense of continuity and, and continuity of culture and intellectual history by reading texts that are written in the 1780s, 1790s, 1800s in Germany and ask ourselves, what do they mean for us now? What do they mean for me in the 21st century in Scotland? What do they mean for you? in the 21st century in, in Brazil. Can we find that continuity of culture and intellectual history? The whole point of Jung, I think, is that we can. So what I'd like to do, and we'll, we'll see how many poems we get, they're, they're quite long and we don't want to rush it. And it's not about how many we can get through. If we can get through at least one by Goethe and one by Schiller, I think, I think we'll have done well. So I'd like to start then with um, the first of the poems, um, the dedication of 1784 by, by Goethe. I don't know whether we're able to share the screen and get that copy of the text up as we were doing slightly earlier. We did a little screen share and we got that text up. Let's just see if that works. And it is, there it comes. Beautiful, so we just go to the top, go to page one. There we go, that's, that's, that is just perfect. So we've got the first two stanzas there and I'll just take us down the page as we, as we go. And that, that keeps our focus on the text that we're meant to be looking at. Oh, that's beautiful. That's absolutely perfect. So we've got a text that's called Dedication. Um, it, it, it's interesting because there's another text called Dedication which Jung places in front of Faust. So this idea of dedication is important, both for Faust, but here it's a dedication about, about Jung, about Goethe's own task as a poet. But we might also think about it as, as the vocation of the analyst. We'll, we'll see how that might play out in a moment. So we have this text, dedication, that's quite abstract, but you'll notice that the text starts very, very concrete 
we're in a narrative. The morn arrived, his footstep quickly scared. We've got a, I'm not gonna read out the poem, that would take us too long. I'm just gonna describe it, comment on the important bits. And then when we get to the questions, we can see whether I got it right or wrong. So we start off in this poem in morning. And we'll see in lots of Goethe texts, morning as a, a liminal time, a time of change. And we already see in this first stanza that morning, when we say morning has arrived, we're talking about something in allegorical terms. We're personifying something. We're taking something abstract, something, a time of day like morning, we're turning it into a person. And we'll see this whole idea of allegory is very important for Goethe. We might also think, is allegory very important for Jung? Think about the way that Jung writes his red book talking and dialoguing with his soul. So we have someone who is, it's morning, um, they wake up, they um, go out from their cottage up in, into the mountains. It's full of freshness, the dew drops, it's a youthful day, that's another kind of personification. And everything is quickening, enlivening him. The whole point about life and experience is there in this first first line this first stanza and then we go through down to the second stanza and we're going up the mountain we're climbing up and noticing as we go up the mountains that from the valley there comes a streaky mist and a mist a fog something like that is a natural phenomenon but we'll see that it soon becomes a supernatural phenomenon as well. So we have the idea of these mists, these clouds enveloping the person who's, who's climbing up, a bit like someone climbing up a Swiss mountain. And, um, and as they go up, the morning, the light is replaced by darkness and, and gloom. So as we get to the end of that second stanza, we have, I was left alone in twilight gloom. So you can see how we're shifting between light of day to something paradoxical. All this mist is kind of the darkness of day as well. So let's just move down another couple of stanzas on the page. If we can go down there on the page. That's wonderful. There we go, that's just perfect. Thank you very much, that's beautiful, that's lovely. So we've got these three stanzas here. So we'll see in this poem that what's very, very important are these images of light and dark. And here we have this idea of, of a peculiar light form, it's twilight. We have the sun, even though he's pouring out his light, it's seen as through the mist. We can never see the light of the sun directly. And of course, that's, that's literally true. You can't look at the sun. You, you, you blind yourself if you look at the sun. So we have to see things through mists. We have to see things through veils. And as we'll see, that's a crucial idea in this, in this poem. So here we have this, this idea of changing luminosity, changing light and shadow, until as the wanderer moves up through the mist, we get out into the light, into what's described as a, a dazzling glow. So we have here the idea of a, a trajectory, an ascension, a, a climbing up. Along an inward pulse prompted me. So we have everything we've seen so far has been external. It's been about getting up in the morning, going up, going through the mists, going up to the to the light. But here we have another dimension that's introduced. We have the idea of an inward impulse. In in the German, ein innerer Trieb des Herzens. So something which is motivating us inside. And this motivation causes the speaker of the poem to turn round 
and to all of a sudden see a figure. Then saw I on the clouds born gracefully a godlike woman hovering to and fro. And it, it's an amazing line. We've moved from something which is very natural in something which is supernatural. We've moved into something where we're seeing the landscape into we're all of a sudden seeing a godlike woman floating around on a cloud. Ein göttlich weib. And we can see, and we'll see that this figure will be more precisely described in a moment, but it is literally the divine feminine. It's ein göttlich weib. It is literally the divine feminine. Remember, we've already been set up for the idea of allegorical exchanges, and it's possible to have this allegorical interchange with the person. We're back in business. Well, should I, should I, um, should I, where did we lose you, Isa? Okay, that's wonderful. That's great. No problem. That's great. Okay, smashing stuff. That's good. So um, uh, what we see in that third stanza, which is which is set in a which is set in a natural setting, is um, uh, a, an essential imagery about light. We have light and darkness. We have the sun, he's climbing up the mountain. Remember, we're going up and up the mountain and we've got this mixture of cloud and sun. And so far, everything we've seen is natural. But at this point, things become supernatural because in this landscape, he suddenly comes across, he's prompted by what is described as an inward impulse. So everything so far has been external, Everything so, cut, so far has been natural. Now we have something which is to do with the person inwardly, an inner retrieve, an inner drive. And we have something which is very, well, not natural, it's very supernatural, is that the wanderer is prompted to look round and see this figure on the clouds, born gracefully, floating there, a figure described as a godlike woman, ein göttlich weib, a woman who's literally divine. This, this allegorical figure, we might say, this allegorical figure of the divine feminine. And this figure is not just there, but the speaker is interacting with her. She gazed at me. Okay? So there is a relationship that's set up between the speaker and this divine feminine figure that he's encountered. And then We'll just do this last stanza here before we move the page, but it's just fine as it is now. What does she say to him? She says, do you not know me? Do you not recognize me? So there's already a relation between the eye of the speaker, the ego, if you like, and this divine feminine. Kennst du mich nicht? Do you not know me? She says. And she appeals to the memories that he has of his childhood. What this figure of the divine feminine is saying is, you always already knew me. There is always already a connection that's there. She says, did I not see thee when a stripling, when a young man, yearning to welcome me with tears, heartfelt and burning? We've got a text which is full of the divine. We've got a text which is full of emotion as well and appealing back to memories of childhood. Okay, let's move on to the next few stanzas. Just go down a little bit onto the next page. There we go, perfect. That is beautiful, that's just perfect. We get three on the screen, that is wonderful. And we have this moment of response. Yes, I exclaimed, overcome with, with joy. It's an incredible poem, this, for the intensity of the emotions that are, that are informing it. And in particular here, the idea of an intensity of a moment of, of recognition. 
that he says, in fact, what I'm now seeing is something that I knew, but I didn't know that I know, he says. He says, I recognize you as a force that has always comforted me, always sustained there, sustained me, always been there from me. You are a figure, he says in the final line, through thee alone, true bliss can be obtained. So this, this figure of the divine feminine is of immense importance for the emotional satisfaction of the individual. And yet, he says, thy name I know not. Dich nenne ich nicht. Okay. So there is a block. There is some kind of difficulty here as well, because he says, well, I recognize you, but I don't know your name, he says. For all the importance that she has, he says, there is something which gets in the way, he says. He says, I must veil and hide thy radiance fair. And we'll see this image of the veil is going to prop up again as being super important later on in the, in the poem. The woman responds with a smile. She knows so much more than he knows. This divine feminine really is divine. She really is feminine as well. And she says, thou seest how wise, how prudent it was, but little to unveil. She says, she says, I'm going to pretend to leave you. I'm going to pretend to go away if you do not know my name. So there is, there is humor. There is, there is exchange between these people. And it reminds me so much of those passages in Jung's Red Book when there are very peculiar humorous exchanges that Jung has with his, his soul, kind of jokes, there's a kind of humor that's in there as part of this emotional intensity as well. And she says, well, I'm prepared to leave you in peace. I'm prepared to, to leave you on your, on your own. And that then brings us into the final few sections of the, the poem. So if we just go down another few stanzas as well. That's excellent. That's just perfect. Okay. So pardon me, I cried. Okay. He, so immediately there is this, this sense of retreat, of, of not wanting to, ups, to, to upset this, uh, this powerful uh, figure. And he says, I will know how to value your gifts. And we'll have to see what that gift is, because there's going to be one gift in particular that's important. He says, I know what it is that I will value about you. I will know why it is so important for me to have come out on this mountain today and to meet you. And as he says this, as I answered toward me, she turned her face. So the divine, which has threatened to go away, now comes back again with kindly sympathy, that godlike one. So she does understand, really, what he means. Within her eye full plainly could I trace what I had failed in. So he's learning what he's doing wrong. There is something pedagogic. There is something instructional in this encounter, this strange encounter that he's having. What I'd done wrong and what I'd done right. She smiled and cured me with that smile's sweet grace. So the smile communicates an immense emotional intensity and the effect of this is described as to newborn joys my spirit soared anon. Before we came in I was talking with Marcus about the word geist and how it, difficult it was to translate the word geist well, we've got in German the word Geist here. Zu neuen Freuden stieg mein Geist heran. To newborn joys my spirit soared and on. So there's a real emotional roller coaster that one goes through in this, in this poem. With this new sense of joy, this elevation of the spirit, the soul, the mind, he says, I could now draw closer to her and observe her. He can now approach the divine figure and then comes this moment of, of of exchange through the light cloud she stretches out her hand there is this gesture that she is going to pass something to him and if we go down then to the uh, next few stanzas we're going to come to the key moment in the poem 
uh, which brings it to its conclusion. So if we can just go down the screen a little bit there, that's, that is just fabulous there. And what she's gonna give him is something that she came out of. Remember, she emerges out of the mists and she is gonna give him, as it were, a kind of essence of mist. She's going to give him what is described as a veil of purest white. This veil, which is swirling around her in a thousand folds. And she says, I know you, we've seen this before, this whole idea of identification or being known by someone else. She says, ich kenne dich. she says, I know you. I know that the good that is within you and I'm gonna give you the prize long destined. I'm now going to give you this ultimate gift, which is, and quoting that line there on that stanza, which we can see second stanza on the page, the veil of minstrelsy from truth's own hand. Slightly out of date um, translation there, lovely translation, but slightly out of date. It is the veil of poetry. It is der Dichtungsschleier. It is the veil of poetry aus der Hand der Wahrheit, out of the hand of truth. And so who is this Göttlich Weib? She is truth. She is the allegorical figure of truth who gives us, who gives the speaker, who gives Goethe, the veil of poetry. And although the veil conceals things, it allows other things to be revealed for them that we wouldn't be able to see directly, like the light of the sun, that we can see safely through the mist, but we cannot see Okay, so we now move on to the final couple of lines. Let's just look at those final couple of lines, which brings the poem to its conclusion. That is beautiful there, that's great. And the whole point about this gift of the veil is that it is not just a gift that's given to, um, to the speaker, that's given to the poetic eye, that's given to Goethe, but this gift is going to be shared with everybody. It's a gift that the poet will be able to use to delight all those that he comes in contact with. He says, when thou and thy friends at fierce noonday. Okay. So there's a social dimension to this, this veil, this gift of poetry from the hand of truth that we approach truth through poetry is a gift that's going to be shared. And we remember that um, in fact, when Goethe writes about his own life, he calls his biography Dichtung und Wahrheit, poetry and truth, poetry and truth. The things are not seen as oppositions, they're seen as being connected together. And this gift of poetry will have an immense transformative effect. The tones of earthly woe will die away, the grave become a bed of clouds so fair, to sing to rest life's billows will be seen, the day be lovely and the night serene. It's a beautiful, transformative, refreshing function that art will have. And so that's why then at the end of the poem, the poet turns around and addresses us, the audience, come friends, he says, come along. And whenever you find life's heavy load getting you down, these flowers, these works of art, these poetic utterances, he says, are available for you and will bestow golden fruits. So leben wir, so wandeln wir beglückt. We'll seek the coming day with joyous mind. It's an incredible transformative promise, which is, which is spoken of here in this final stanza, and one which will be intergenerational, which we will pass down to our children and our grandchildren, it's a beautiful image of the transforming effect of art, as well as that cultural intellectual continuity that we saw Goethe, uh, that we saw Jung talking about with, um, in association with Goethe in memories, uh, dreams, uh, reflections. So we made that through, that was, that, was, that was great. I can see we're a little bit up against the time here. Um, but what, I, what I'd like to do, if everybody's still up for it, is to have a little look, look at the Schiller poem 
And I think we can, if we do one by Goethe and one by Schiller, and then we can have some questions, that might be, that might be a good way of, of doing it. So we're gonna move on to Schiller and it's a big change. Boy, is it a big change, completely different style. And one of the problems that Schiller has is that his style doesn't work so well for everybody today for various reasons. First of all, as you can see, it's a very long poem. Schiller writes long poems. It's just what he does. It's like Wagner writing long operas. There's no such thing as a short version of The Ring. It, it lasts a long time. Of course, that also might make us think, well, maybe we ought to have more time for poetry. And are we doing things that are so much more important than we can read Schiller? But it's still a big ask. So, so Schiller does have problems. There's another problem. Everything that he writes is chock full of mythological references. Now, for you guys as Jungians, that'll be fine because you'll all know your mythology absolutely perfectly. But outside uh, Jungian and analytical cir uh, circles, not everybody does nowadays. So we run up against a cultural barrier that people just don't recognize all the references that are in that are in the poems. And there's a third difficulty, and that is the Goethe poem that we that we saw was very concrete. We had this ascent up the mountain. We had the images of luminosity. Um, we had this epiphany, this vision of the divine woman. Um, it, it, it's very concrete. It's, 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 it's full of details from the natural world. We don't find that with Schiller. He's far more abstract. He's far more philosophical. Really what we have here in this poem is a little bit of philosophy in verse form. And yet Schiller was enormously significant for Jung too. If you look, as you know, in Psychological Types, in volume six, a huge long chapter about Schiller, his aesthetic treatises. If you think this poem is abstract, try reading Schiller's aesthetic treatises, even more abstract. And yet Jung dedicates at least 50, 60 pages to a very detailed examination of Schiller's on the aesthetic education, on the aesthetic education and on naive and sentimental poetry. So these, these great treatises, once very important, not read so much today, were important for Jung as well. So let's see if we can get Schiller to work a little bit of magic for us. It, it's harder than Goethe and, and it's just the way it is, but if we try hard, maybe we can get something out of it. I, I've grown to like Schiller more and more. And the more and more other people don't like him, the more and more I do like him. That's, that's, that's just the dynamic. And we can see already, if you, if you think of the title, we've got something, the ideal and the actual life, das Ideal und das Leben, we're already dealing with abstract terms, aren't we? We've, we've got these abstract terms here. But I think we'll see that in this poem, Schiller is trying to make that abstractness concrete. We'll see how he does it. And I think the idea that Schiller is purely abstract is wrong, that he's actually also very concerned with the material world as, as well. And just to say um, uh, uh, two things before we go into the poem. First of all, he published different versions of it with different titles. The first title was The Realm of the Shadows. The Realm of the Shadows. So think about the underworld think about the idea of going into the underworld. So the first title was The Realm of the Shadows, Das Reich der Schatten. The second one they called was The Realm of Forms, Das Reich der Formen, The Realm of Forms, and we'll see the idea of form and platonic form in particular comes into this poem very directly. And then thirdly, he gives it something which um, has this idea of linking the ideal and the actual, das Ideal und das Leben, and that's the final version, and that's the one that we're going to look at. Second thing I wanted to share is that it said that um, another great German intellectual 
of the period when Goethe and Schiller lived, um, uh, Wilhelm von Humboldt. It said that Humboldt would read this poem by Schiller in the secrecy of his study, just as one would read a psalm or just as one would say one's prayers. So we can think of this, this text as a kind of prayer, as a kind of psalm, as a kind of hymn that we might use for our devotions. And what does it mean if we have devotions? It, me it means we believe there's something above us. And we'll see that Schiller, while he's not a religious poet, thinks it's very important that we have the idea of something above us. And I think that's also something which is very important for Jung as well. He's not a religious thinker, in my view, but he has this idea of a belief in something above us being essential um, for how we see ourselves. So I'm aware that it's much longer. We'll zip through a bit, a bit more, just picking out little bits which will help us deal with it. I'll just read the first couple of lines and you can already see how abstract it is. He's not going to make it easy for us, but well, why should he? Forever fair, forever calm and bright, life's fly on plumage, zephyr light. For those who on the Olympian hill rejoice, you could, we've got a huge long sentence coming up. We've got the reference to Olympian hill where the gods live and so on. We've got our classical references there. But actually we look at it as well, life flies on plumage. The idea of life fluttering around on wings. We've got another allegory. We've got another allegory. It's not that different from the Goethe poem in certain respects. And this first stanza here that we can see on the screen sets up this essential distinction between the life of the gods and the life of human beings. And that's set up as a difference, but we'll see Schiller is going to try and erode that difference. That's what he's going to do. He's going to try. He so he says there's this difference between the gods and humankind, but as we'll see, this difference actually collapses at the end. So let's just go down to the next page if we can. Okay, that's that's great. We're going to have to move through more more, more quickly because it's 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 a much longer poem. Um, but I'll still try and pick out the important things. First of all, there, seekest thou on earth the life of God's to share? So that's Schiller's question. Do you want to live the life of the gods? A kind of a slightly strange question, but it wouldn't be to somebody Epicurus who talks about living on earth as, as the gods would live on earth. It's about discovering the divine which is within us. And we've already seen Goethe talking about the divine in that figure of the, the Göttlich Weib, the divine woman that he, that he sees. So that's what Schiller is trying to get us to think about, is what would it mean to lead a divine life? But he's going to ask it, how would we lead a divine life on the earth? Seekest thou on earth life of gods to share? It's not just about escaping from the earth, it's about what do we do when on it? And in the second stanza, which we can see there, that's perfectly fine. This introduces the idea of the weavers of the web. And we'll constantly see, it's one of the interesting things about these poems, is the idea of veils and webs, things which are inter interwoven. It's a very interesting image that Jung is very interested in as, as well. Um, we find it here, the idea of the weavers of the web, who are, in mythological terms, the faints, uh, the fates, okay. they're working away on an earthly level. In other words, we are determined physically by, by laws of nature, by our class backgrounds, by our gender, whatever. It's not as if we're in, it's not as if we're free individuals. We come predetermined in some way. And yet, Schiller is going to say, for all that determination, for all that faithfulness that we have, we can be free. That, that's the extraordinary argument that he has. How can we be free? Because he says there is the form, the archetype. There it is, the word in the middle of that second stanza, the form, the archetype. Now, before we get too excited, the German word is, is not archetype. The word is die Gestalt. But archetype is not a bad translation because what, after all, is an archetype 
if it isn't a gestalt, if it isn't a form. So I think it's not a bad translation of that to call it that. It is the gestalt, the form. And that's the big question with Jungians, isn't it? Is how do we understand the archetype? It may come back to me soon in the questions. It's because there are forms, because there are gestalt, because there are archetypes, that we are able to, as he says, high from this cramped and dungeon being, spring into the realm of the idea. In des idealis Reich, we can spring into the realm of the idea. And this looks as if this is all very escapist, but I want to try and show you that it, that it isn't. It's a misreading, I think, to see it as escapism. The ideal is, is what informs our life on earth. That's what Schiller is trying to say. And that's what he says in the next line. If we just take us down the page a little bit, a little bit down into those stanzas there. That's perfect. That's lovely. That's beautiful. So he says, here, bathed perfection in the purest ray is the archetypal man, der Menschheit Götterbild. So the divine image of humanity. And that is here, it's free from our earthly life, but it informs it. So it's not as if it's nothing to do with our life, it's, it's existing in our life in a different way. That's the important thing about the, about the ideal. Um, so there is a divine image of what it means to be human. And as I say, this is, it sounds religious. I don't think he does mean it's, it, but it's not a conventional religious argument. But the idea is saying is that the, there is an image of humanity which in itself is divine, has a divine quality to it. But he recognizes, well, it's all very well saying we've got this freedom. Nevertheless, in that uh, second stanza there, life still must drag the onward as it flows. Shedder is not saying we can escape from life. It still drags us onward, but it's how we react to that being dragged onward that offers us the opportunity of freedom. And that opportunity of freedom comes when he says we see things from the hilltops of the beautiful. Again, another allegory. From the Schönheit Hügel, from the hilltops of the beautiful. If we take the right perspective, if we use beauty, to give us the right perspective, we can see a freedom that we didn't otherwise see that we have. And we remember the whole point about the veil of, of poetry from the hand of truth was going to have a transformative effect. So we can see this transformative effect here as, as well. That when we see things from the hilltops of the beautiful, we get a different perspective. We get a different view on, uh, on life. Um, so if we just sit down the page a little bit, I'm going to skip that next particular stanza and just go down a little bit to the next one, if we can go down a bit. Just to send a little bit further down the page. That's very good. Okay, so fine, stop there. Perfect. That's beautiful. Again, he says, life whose source by crags around it piled, chafed while confined, foams fierce and wild. It, there is a real poetry, if you read it in German, which is which is quite good, is that he says, even though life is full of waves and destruction, it's foaming. At the same time, water, which can be rough and choppy and full of waves and dangerous, it's also water that can glide soft and soothe. So the water shows us both the troubled aspects of life and this calm serenity that can be part of it. If, he says, we gain the still beautiful. Um, we've got that line there where he talks about if we can uh, life will flow more smoothly if we can see it from the perspective of beauty. So. The idea here is that the aesthetic has a transformative effect. It's about, it, these poems are immensely transformational poems the way that they, they see art as, uh, as function. And then this art is given a particularly material, concrete form by Schiller, 
when we move into a metaphor which informs the next uh, uh, the next few lines, um, where he talks about the activity of the great sculptor. He says, the kingdom genius, some great sculptor glows. And what we find here throughout this poem, through many of its stanzas, the idea of sculpting and shaping. And remember, a sculpture, a statue, is obviously material. There it is, it's a chunk of stone and very heavy. But it has a shape, it has a form, and that's what transforms it from something purely material into the work of art. That's why there is this great call in Schiller's, in, in Schiller's poem. Um, try and move us on so we can get through it in, in time. He calls us onward to the sphere of beauty, go. So there is an appeal to us as a reader to enter into this realm of beauty. Onward, a child of art. And again, remember, think about that Goethe poem where the divine feminine was speaking to the figure of the wanderer. These poems are all about engagement. They're all about engaging with the world that we find ourselves in. He says, out of the matter which thy pains can call the statue springs. And so again, we have this idea, very ancient idea uh, in the Western tradition of liberating the statue from the stone. The idea that the statue is somehow within the stone and has to be released uh, from it. Not as with labor run from the hard block, but as from nothing sprung, airy and light, the offspring of the soul. So this will be even more impressive than the act of the sculptor is bringing the soul. Key word for Jung, or meine Seele, where are you, my soul? He says in the Red Book. This will be something which, which springs out of the material world. So carry on down. Um, the next stanza is, I'm going to try and move us through these. Um, if we look at, at the next stanza, it's essentially, um, if human sin confront the rigid law, is about human inadequacy. Keep going down, keep going down. If you go down a little bit more, there we go. That's wonderful, just pause there. Um, I'm, I'm not going to dwell on human inadequacy. That's, that's all too clear. Great lines here. Fly the boundary of the senses. Live the ideal life free thought can give. It sounds as if he's telling us to, to turn our backs on the earth, but as we've seen, it's not that. It is about not being limited by the sensory world. Um, it's about living the ideal life free thought can give. And there's all kinds of political dimensions to this stuff as, as well. We, we can maybe talk about the politics of some of this um, uh, German idealism as, as well. And, and why do I say it's about the way we live our life? Well, look, Schiller himself says, let but divinity become thy will. Okay. In, in the German, it's take up divinity into your will. So this is, the will is something is something that we exercise. So this is about engaging with freedom and the ideal and divinity, not turning our back on the earth, but integrating those things into it. Um, it then gives, in the second stanza that we have on the screen there, an example from very famous um, uh, the statue uh, of Laocon. And, and Laocon is a, a, an individual from, from Greek myth who suffers terribly by, by um, a huge sea serpent uh, coming and uh, squeezing him to death. But the whole point is, is this suffering that even within these immense sufferings, it's possible to be free. That's, that's the argument that the German idealists took from these work of, works of art. And this is explained if we go down a little bit into the third stanza that's there, if we just go down a bit. That's absolutely perfect. Where we're told in the ideal realm, we can see lower con rides, but does not groan. If we are in this ideal realm, we can transmute our suffering, we can transcend our suffering, we can overcome it. And, and this suffering is, is real physical suffering. It's not denied that it's real. 
It's not denied that it's physical, but it's about how do we change it? How do we transform it? How do we transmute it? And, and art is the answer for these, art, uh, for these thinkers as to how it's going to do it. Art, we're told, gleaming through grief's dark veil. This image of the veil, again, so important to the way that this tradition um, thinks. And now we are, we're doing really well on time here. We've just got three more stanzas to go. So let's have a little uh, look at them. Uh, so in the glorious parable, behold, how bowed to mortal bonds of old, life dreary path divine Alcides trod. And who is Alcides? It's another name for Hercules. And these last two stanzas, actually, even good news, folks, it's not three stanzas of Schiller, it's two stanzas. So in these final two stanzas, we concentrate on the mythical figure of Hercules. And Hercules is, of course, the great archetypal figure of struggle. He has all these tasks to perform, terrible tasks, very energy absorbing, very exhausting. He lives his life performing these tasks. No sooner has he finished one task than he has another to do. And yet, look what happens to Hercules. Hercules, as a hero, is a semi-divine figure. And as a semi-divine figure, at the end of his life, Hercules becomes divine. He actually ascends, he's taken up onto Olympus, that Olympian site that we saw referred to in the very first stanza. So we can see the mythological references there in this last but one stanza. The reference to the black-browed god is the reference to Charon, the ferryman of the souls across the sea. There's the reference to Juno or Hera, the wife of Zeus who begot Hercules with Al Alcmene. So a reference to this semi-divine origin, the offspring of a god um, and, a, and a, human, a human woman. And we have this idea of all of these torments that he goes through until the god cast down his garb of clay and rent in hallowing flame away the mortal part from the divine to soar to the imperial air. So again, we have the same dynamic that we saw in the Goethe poem. Remember that he is at one moment full of joy and his spirit soars up when he identifies with the Goethe Goethe's vibe when he identifies with the divine woman, there is this immense sense of a release of spirit upwards. And here we have exactly the same dynamic. This is an abstract poem, it's a philosophical poem, but so many of the dynamics in these two texts are the same. And he soars up into the air. And that, of course, is the mythical representation of his apotheosis, of his becoming. Uh, divine. And all that is dull matter, that's fine. That can fade away. It's not negated. It's not denied, but it's not as important as what is in divine. And so if we go into these final lines just over the page, if we just go down a little bit more. There we go. That's lovely. That's fine. Beautiful. Thank you very much. So this earthly life, the dull matter, sinks downward, downward, downward as a dream. So we have this verticality going downwards of the purely material, the simply material life. It's not that it's denied, but it is its only material. It needs to be transformed and transmuted like the block that the sculptor has. It's not that the sculptor denies the, the material stone in front of him, but he has to transform it in order for it to become the statue. And as the material world sinks away, so up he rises, Hercules, in order to be welcomed among the gods. Olympian hymns receive the escaping soul. So Hercules is going to join the gods up on Olympus. And a beautiful image, which again gives us a sense of, of, the, of the divine feminine, smiling Hebe from the ambrosial stream, 
fills for a god the bowl. So Hebe, a daughter of Zeus, the wife of Hercules, and most important of all, the goddess of eternal youth. She is the cup bearer to the gods. She brings delight in the glass uh, to the gods and she reaches him, Hercules, this, um, this bowl full of ambrosial um, uh, 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 liquid. She gives him this, this sign of welcome, this, this libation, uh, in order to welcome Hercules, um, who has who has become divine, who has become godlike, just as earlier on in the poem we were t we were asked, well, how are we going to live our life amongst um, amongst uh, human beings? How would we uh, seek on earth the life of gods to share? The model for how we would do that is Hercules, who is semi divine. But Schiller's whole point is that human beings if we understand our formal archetypal aspect, that, that we are already semi-divine as well. We just have to realize it and translate that into action. So we've gone through two texts there. Um, I think at that point, it would be lovely to have some questions and comments uh, from you. We've done one by Goethe, one by Schiller. I'd really like to know what you think. Obrigado, Paul, pelo texto. Bom, vamos lá. Quem quiser fazer as perguntas, por favor, coloque o nome no chat e aí eu chamo as pessoas perguntarem, tá? Paul, é, queria fazer, a partir do poema, uma pergunta mais ampla, mais larga, por assim Mas, dizer. É, ao, ao ler a tua obra, yeah. teus, teus vários livros e textos, a gente parece que todos eles partem de um princípio afirmativo, que a psicologia analítica ela é uma herdeira direta do classicismo de Weimar. É... Queria que você falasse um pouco isso. Essa, essa é, uma, é, uma, é um ponto de vista seu? Essa é uma... É uma... de Weimar do classicismo alemão de Weimar. Isso é uma confirma, é um ponto de vista seu? É uma é uma conclusão que você chegou depois de longo tempo? Queria que você desenvolvesse um pouco essa essa argumentação para gente. Porque me parece que ela está presente em todos os seus livros. No livro do Nietzsche, no livro sobre Goethe, nos textos sobre Schiller. Yeah, yeah, that's great. That's that. That's a good question. Thank you. Th thank you very much. Um, I think, in a word, yes. That that's what I'm trying to show, is that there is a continuity between uh, this this very brief period in Germany, from about 1770 to 1800, uh, which one can identify as as a, a period of classicism in German thought before it goes into Romanticism, that the classicism offers an, an ethics and a, and a philosophy and a way of life which is all about balance. It's about the intellect and the emotions, it's about the body and the soul, it's about the life of the mind and, and yes, also you know, the physical drives and passions as, as well. They have been brought together and coordinated in some form. And, and having read those that tradition separately and then Jung separately, you suddenly notice, oh, there are echoes in the one that you find in the, in the other. And the whole point of trying to show um, a continuity between them is not to say that Jung was unoriginal, is not to make him uh, a purely second-hand thinker, it's to see him as someone trying to revive in the 20th century what was happening in the 18th century. And for me, that explains why Jung says that he was an illegitimate child of Goethe. Of course, he wasn't literally 
an illegitimate child of Goethe, but it's a way of linking himself with, with the great grandfather. It's a way of linking himself with that tradition and saying, what I'm doing is not so very different from what others have done before me. Uhum. Você aponta uma continuidade, você diria isso? It, it, that, that's exactly the idea. It, it's exactly that phrase that we find mm -hmm. Jung talking about in Memories, Dreams, Reflections, where he talks about cultural and intellectual continuity. And that point is something mm -hmm. which in the arts and humanities in the West today is, is a controversial standpoint. That is a controversial standpoint. For a postmodernist audience, there is not continuity. There is only rupture. There is only discontinuity. There is inaccessibility. There is, um, th there is no self. There is no center. There is only a margin. There is only dissemination. And maybe that's true. Perhaps that's, perhaps that's what it's like, but that's not what Jung says. And that's not what the tradition he comes out of says. Um, and it seems to me that when you're understanding an author, there are, there are two moves that you have to make. The first one is to work out what on earth they are saying. What is their actual argument? The second one is, well, is, is, is to ask, is the argument valid? Is it a valid position? And that's fine. And we can talk about that. The first thing, however, is always to work out What is it that the person is saying? And I think that the, the tradition of Goethe and Schiller is often misrepresented, just as Jung is often misrepresented as a thinker. So it's about trying to get these people understood properly in order to debate what they're saying. Perfeito. Obrigado, Paul. Vamos começar. A Minelis, a Minelis Maroni, querida, por favor. Ok. Desculpe, eu queria muito agradecer o professor Paul Bishop, porque a palestra foi muito erudita, retomou um termo, uma tradição clássica do Jung. O Jung era um respeitador da tradição, e isso me faz é, uma ponte com ele, né? Ele não é o novo, ele sempre fala, não, voltamos aos povos originários, voltamos aos filósofos, voltamos a uma tradição. Eu acho que isso é uma construção humilde do Jung e muito bonita. Né? Eu quero te dizer, Paul, que você me foi apresentado por um grande nitiniano brasileiro, que talvez você conheça que é Oswaldo Giacoia. Oswaldo, ele é o nosso mais importante professor de Nietzsche. E ele me falou, a Mineres, leia o Paul Bishop no, no livro O Self eh, Dionisíaco. Você vai gostar. Eu fico muito agradecida e quero homenagear o professor Oswaldo Giacoia, que me apresentou a você há mais ou menos uns 15, 20 anos, não foi agora. Né? Faz muito tempo, uns 15 anos. Eu quero fazer uma pergunta, porque eu gosto dessa ideia da tradição. Mas o Jung, ele é a tradição, mas ele também é a inovação. E eu acho que ele é muito chileriano. Eu escrevi minha tese de doutorado há uns 40 anos atrás, 35, por aí. E eu tenho um capítulo no Jung, o poeta da alma, que é o nome do, da minha tese, que foi publicada, que chama-se A Ferida de Anfortas. E eu fiz uma relação entre Jung e Schiller, num texto que eu me apaixonei pelo Schiller, chamado Cartas, no Brasil foi publicado como Cartas é, é, sobre a Educação Estética do Homem. E o Jung, ele se ancora muito no, no Schiller para pensar 
a questão da modernidade. Né? Então, ele tem a tradição, mas ele tem a questão da modernidade. E na carta 5, me lembro até o, no, o número da carta, ele faz uma aproximação entre o homem grego e o homem moderno. E ele faz a pergunta, o que poderia o homem moderno frente ao homem grego? Não poderia nada. O homem uh, moderno é um fragmento de si mesmo, ou algo parecido. Ele não pode, uh, não tem a potência do homem grego. Eu penso que no Schiller isso ainda é uma, um eco do romantismo, particularmente de Jean-Jacques Rousseau, né? e ele, ele faz, uh, tem um eco romântico em que tem essa, uma operação do passado para renovar o presente, digamos assim. E eu penso que nas outras cartas, ele segue também o Schiller, porque a ideia de beleza é a ideia do símbolo no Jung. Ele faz essa é, equiparação, essa equalização da beleza com o símbolo. E eu acho isso muito bonito, né? Quer dizer, o que, que é o homem inteiro? O homem inteiro é um homem não dissociado, como é o homem moderno. Eu penso que o Schiller tem essa, essa crítica também à modernidade muito forte, que está presente no Jung. E eu penso que essa ideia do símbolo é a ideia de beleza do Schiller. Pelo menos foi isso que eu defendi na minha tese de doutorado. Né? E eu penso que hoje esses autores voltam a ser muito atuais. Porque nós estamos numa catástrofe climática, numa catástrofe de fim dos tempos. E a reintegração do homem na totalidade que não necessariamente é uma totalidade em si, mas é uma totalidade em Gaia, né? ele pode ser muito importante para nós como uma proposta de redenção realmente, de salvação da própria humanidade. Queria te ouvir, desculpe se me estendi, mas é muito importante para mim. No, well, thank you, thank you very much for your for your question and um, and and thank you for your kind remark and um, I'm glad that you found what I've written about about Nietzsche and Jung um, helpful. That was really the starting point of this voyage into rediscovering German literature uh, through through Jung, and I I think you're absolutely right to to present Schiller as as a, a critic of of modernity um, and, and that's really what the aesthetic letters are all about is trying to understand what is this fissure what is this split that defines uh, modern human beings it's not just Schiller's problem it, it, it's Rousseau's it's it, it, it's the great political social economic Marx has it as well the idea of alienation so very close the ideas of Marx and Schiller in this in this respect uh, the great psychological uh, the great psychoanalytic question how do we heal this this year how do we heal this this split and it's interesting and, and Jung must have been delighted to see it when uh, when Schiller proposes in the aesthetic letters this um, the notion of the symbol as you say is the idea of, of beauty. We just saw in the Schiller poem how important beauty is to give us a fresh perspective. Um, and, and in both Schiller's poem and Jung's, the symbol acts as a, as a vehicle. It's, it's not just a thing, but it is, it is a vehicle. It is, it is something by means of which a totality is brought into being or, or, or recreated or, or recovered. And, and that's, that's why um, both Schiller and Jung are, as it were, critics of modernity, but they're also therapists of modernity as, as well. And we're used to thinking of Jung as a therapist, but it's also interesting 
if there is this uh, similarity in the way they approach problems, can we see Schiller as a therapist of culture? Because I think that's what he saw his mission as. And you can see in the Goethe poem as well, the idea of handing, handing to the poet the veil of poetry from the hand of truth is that that is to be shared, that the, the transformative effect of art is at once something for the individual, but it also has broader social implications as well. And so that's why Goethe and Schiller and Jung too are political thinkers. In a way, there is both a psychological and a sociological dimension to what they're doing. So thank you very much for your question, because I, I agree that, that, that Schiller is, is a, a critic of modernity. Um, and if we align him with Jung, we can see that he is a therapist of modernity as well. Obrigada, Paul. Obrigada, Mineris. É, pô, eu vou fazer uma, uma pergunta, eu queria, queria te agradecer pela tua exposição, pela beleza da sua exposição, é, e trazer um pouquinho de beleza também assim para o nosso dia a dia, que ainda é tão árido e literal, né? E a minha pergunta acho que vai ainda nessa linha, nessa direção do que você acabou de responder para Mineres. É, mas assim, é, trazendo um pouco para os dias atuais, né, nesses tempos de pandemia que a gente vive, em que foi tirado muito da nossa beleza, que a gente tem que ficar em casa, se relacionando assim, é, virtualmente, e com essa onda da extrema direita que está no mundo, né, com essa intolerância que a gente viu agora com os talibãs, enfim, o que, que a arte, a poesia e a literatura podem fazer por nós? Essa é a minha pergunta. Well, um, I, I think that Jung and his psychology does after all have built into it this social dimension through the idea of, of collectivity. Um, after all, the unconscious is for Jung, not just an individual affair, but a, but a collective affair. Um, and, and that means if we think through what Jung means by, by the collective unconscious, is that we have connections, not just between ourselves as, as individuals in the current moment with all its struggles and difficulties, but that we also have a continuity going back through time to previous individuals, previous societies, previous cultures, our, our ancestors, as Jung, as Jung calls them. And, and I think that's why his idea of, of the archetype as a repeated situation, um, as not a thing, but as a kind of existential moment in which one, in which one finds oneself, does have great uh, political resonance. Because it means if people in the past were able to endure and overcome their struggles, then we ourselves can. And that there is an immensely consoling and invigorating effect through seeing local particular difficulties in, in a wider and universal sense. And I think that's why the universal, as we saw it reflected in that Schiller poem and elsewhere in his thought, is such a powerful idea because it means that my problem is not just my problem, it, it is a universal problem. And that means, and, and if we realize that other people's problems are not just theirs, but human problems as well, we realign our perspectives in a way that, that make uh, new ways of solving those problems possible. It, it's, it's a, to, give it a, to give it a term, it's a way of, of making empathy political, that we realize the common things that bind us together. Obrigado. Obrigado, Lu. Arthur, tá contigo. Oi, gente. É, agradecer a palestra do Paul e pelo trabalho, né, que ele vem fazendo há tanto tempo, né? É incrível. É, 
Bom, eu queria tentar formular três perguntas, na verdade, assim, rapidamente, né? É, três pontos que eu gostaria que, que, que você pudesse comentar. O primeiro é uma pergunta que é a seguinte, é, o Goethe tem uma obra também importante no campo da ciência. Então, ele tem um trabalho é, sobre botânica, que ele faz críticas ao Lineu, ele tem um trabalho sobre cores, né, que ele se contrapõe a Newton, e ele tem um trabalho até sobre ossos, né, sobre a alçada humana, e, e, e ele antecipa Dar, Darwin. Né? É, o Jung sofre influência desse trabalho científico do Jung, né? como, é que é essa, como é que isso impacta o Jung? Né? Esse é o primeiro ponto. Uma, né, eu nunca vi um... Sobre, alguém falando sobre isso, né? Um, um segundo ponto é, é, é com relação a, a, ao Fausto do Goethe, né? É, tem uma passagem que impacta, parece muito, o Jung, que é a passagem quando é, a casa do Filemon e, e da Balsis é destruída, né? E pelo, pelo Mephistófeles, e, e ali tem ali uma destruição da casa daqueles que recebem os deuses, né? Então tem ali uma mudança na relação com os deuses, né? E, e parece uma mudança também do, dos nossos tempos, né? Eu não sei quem falou, mas alguém disse, né? Que para os gregos era o, o, o mito era o Édipo e para os modernos agora o mito é Fausto, né? E essa relação do ego é, com, com, com o Mephistófeles, né? esse ego falso né? que deseja tanto. Enfim, queria que comentasse também esse ponto. Né? Da... E, por último, o, é, a questão de estamos relacionando o Jung com o romantismo. Né? Como é essa relação com o romantismo? É, com o Jung, né? O que eu quero dizer com isso? Porque teve muitas críticas ao romantismo e as críticas, por exemplo, é, os sofrimentos do jovem Werner, né? O, o, vários jovens se mataram porque se apaixonavam, né? E parece que ali também era perto ali da publicação da crítica da razão pura do Kant, né? Que também estava defendendo é, e foi criticado no sentido de que Existe uma razão mais ou menos é, abstrata, né, que, que, que funciona como uma estrutura. Enfim, o, o ponto do abstracionismo. Né? Então, a bela alma do, do Schiller, a gente nunca alcança, né? é tão bela que a gente nunca alcança. Né? A, a história do Goethe, né, que é uma paixão, mas que não se realiza. Então, parece que fica uma coisa também assim... É, da não concretização, né? que são possíveis tendências que podem acontecer no romantismo. Né? Bom, enfim, são esses, esses pontos que eu gostaria que, que comentasse, se possível. Well, uh, that, well, I hope it's possible, Arthur, because those are really great questions and um, there's, there's, there's a lot of material in, uh, in, in what you've said there. So thank you for, uh, for those questions. Um, I, I welcome them all. Um, uh, first of all, you're absolutely right that, that Goethe uh, um, is not just a poet and a novelist and a playwright and a politician and an administrator, but he's also a scientist. It, it, it's part of the, the extraordinary universality of Goethe as a, a figure, which is why uh, Nietzsche in Twilight of the Idols, when he's, he's pointing to a figure of what it would mean to be a Übermensch, to be a Superman, in fact, points to the figure of Goethe. And why? Because he says Goethe embraced this totality in all of his activities, including, as you say, scientific, so zoological, botanical, 
osteological bones. And you're absolutely anticipating Darwin. You're, abs you're absolutely right. Um, and it's interesting that um, this aspect of, of Goethe's um, activity, Goethe as a, as a scientist, um, was taken up by a thinker roughly contem contemporaneous with Jung, because of course it's very important for Rudolf Steiner. Um, and I know that Jungians and Steinerians are completely different camps, but, but I've often wondered if Goethe might be the area for, for a, a rapprochement coming together between these two traditions, um, because on the back of what Goethe writes, um, there is a tradition that calls itself Goethean science, um, which is promoted by essentially um, Steinerian thinkers, so thinker in the in the Steinerian tradition, and I know that doesn't always play well with uh, with, with with everybody. Uh, what's interesting is that um, in the passage in Memories, Dreams, Reflections, when he's talking about his student years, Jung says, "Well, I didn't know what to study," and he says, "I." Part of me wanted to go into the sciences. Part of me wanted to go into the, into the humanities. And it's when he's weighing up his choice between them that he has this extraordinary dream of the radiolarian. That is this, this strange sea creature, this round sea creature, um, uh, which is there um, pulsating in the, in the sea. And, and it, that is an important moment for him when he says, well, I'm going to go into science. So, so this idea of trying to find a balance between the humanities and the science was important for Jung as, as, as well. Um, and it's curious for somebody who starts off as a scientist that they go down a route which has so many obvious cultural connections as, as well. And of course, there's a big debate about Jung's uh, status. Was he a scientist? Was he an artist? I mean, look at the Red Book, look at the texts, look at the pictures. Most recently, the work of Peter Kingsley, was Jung a prophet? So a lot of the many-sidedness that we see in Goethe, actually, we kind of see as well with, with, with Jung as well, because of his immense interests and immense learning, both on the scientific and, and on the cultural front as, as well. Turning to this, very interesting question about um, uh, Philemon and Balkis and the and the destruction of your of, of, of their house. You're absolutely right that this is this is a key episode for uh, for Jung, um, and it's tied up with this strange inscription that he puts um, on his uh, on his house in in, in Bonningen, where he talks about it. As, as being an expression of um, uh, the penitence of Faust. Huh? So um, Jung links the Tower of Bonningen with this episode in, in Faust, which, as you say, uh, marks out that, that realm of Philemon and Balkis as receptive of the gods, as being destroyed by these modern forces of industrialization and land reclamation, um, that the symbolism there would seem to be, even if you welcome the gods, the world itself will destroy the opportunities that you have to, to welcome them. So it's a very, it's a very profound episode, a very disturbing episode. And I think it's one of the reasons why Jung says that he wants to do his work as an act of penitence uh, for Faust, because he, he's, he sees in that episode something which is truly momentous. Um, which is that the, the possibility of receiving and welcoming the gods may no longer be possible in the modern industrialized world. By the way, that quotation that you talked about, the Greeks having their Oedipus and the moderns, the Germans having, having Faust is, is Jakob Burkhardt. Um, so the great Swiss historian whom Jung, he may have known when he was, he was studying in, in, in Basel, um, but it's a, in a letter that, um, uh, Jakob Burkhardt writes to, I think it's Albert Brenner um, uh, at the end of the 19th century, that he says, what Oedipus was for the Greeks, Faust is for, uh, for us. Um, and we talked about the, the importance that Faust had for Jung at the beginning. And I think we can see that it's not just Jung who might find his own dilemma embodied in Faust, but we ourselves might. And, and that's why Faust continues to be such an important work. 
uh, on your third point, really interesting about this relation between classicism and romanticism and, and how Jung sits um, in relation to them. Um, and, and I would agree that in some respects, uh, Jung looks very much like a, a romantic thinker. The, the emphasis on fantasy, the emphasis on, on imagination uh, within the Jungian tradition, uh, people like Angela Jaffe, writing about E.T.R. Hoffman, um, and I can see that there is an affinity. But I think the deeper affinity is with classicism, because the whole point, as I read it in Jung and as I see it in the Red Book, is about the imagination and the fantasies not getting out of control, not being controlled, not managed out of existence, but of being engaged with of one learning how to how to work with fantasy, how to cooperate, how in the case of the Red Book, how to have dialogues with these fantastic, these these imaginary figures or these imaginary is the wrong word, these figures of the fantasy uh, that he that he encounters. Um, and and for me, the Red Book and even more the Black Books is showing Jung trying to work through his fantasies, trying to work with his fantasies, engaging with them, trying to transform them so that he himself can be transformed through the experiences that he has with them. That is, that it seems to be the, that's, that's what's happening in the great mysterium that he talks about in the, uh, in the Red Book. And the case of Werther, I think, is, 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 is interesting because you're right, there is this novel uh, uh, by by Goethe, the early Goethe, the sufferings of young Werther, which is about a fail to individuate, about a failure to to integrate, because he ends up shooting himself and shooting himself very badly. It's it's a, a terrible end. But that's the early Goethe, and I think we can see that the later Goethe is about trying to avoid getting into that, getting into that position. Um, the, one often describes Werther as being uh, what the French would call an example of pre-romanticism, so pre-romanticism. It's it's anticipating what's going to go in and in, in go on in romanticism, but it's it's already a kind of corrective to it because Werther is not an ideal. In the Romantics, the failed individual is the ideal, or or I mean. The, um, the mad uh, musician or the mad painter or the mad artist or the outsider figure, which later becomes a great existential theme, all of that is there in, in Romanticism. But it seems to me that what, what Goethe and Schiller are interested in is how do, you, how do you stand outside the system whilst having to nevertheless live within it? Um, so it's not about escaping from the earth. It's not about escaping from society. It's about how to avoid being um, taken over by those pressures, how to find freedom within those restrictions of the causal world, how to find freedom within those restrictions of the social world as, as well. So I think Jung, for me, comes down more on the classical side of recognizing the imagination, recognizing the feelings, recognizing the passions, but integrating them into consciousness rather than, rather than letting them um, destroy the individual as so often happens in romanticism and as, as it happens in the case of, uh, of Werther as, uh, as well. It's a strange period in Germany that one moves from the 1770s, 1780s, 1790s there's just this brief period 30 years and then one has really a, a century of romanticism and you you might say that existentialism postmodernism are kind of an extension of of the romantic outlook the romantics are interested in fragments the romantics are interested in in a failure to complete um all of those things we might say we've never really recovered from Romanticism. Goethe famously describes Romanticism as, as a sickness. He sees it as something pathological. Um, 
But he can do that because he, he understands the lure, he understands the appeal of it. And I think that's the same with Jung as well, that Jung says, I could be such a good therapist because I know what it's like almost to go mad. I mean, he understands, has this sense of empathy with his patients, but how he helps his patients best is not through going mad himself, or if you like, overcoming his madness, in the form of the of, of the red book and and Jung himself as an would seem to be a very good example of someone who who organizes his his life um, there was an immense pragmatic aspect to the way that Jung lives his his life which would seem to me to suggest that all of this stuff about the imagination and the fantasy is something he takes seriously that it's all about having to how to live harmoniously with it we come back to this idea that a previous speaker had about the importance of, of totality. Totality and integration as being um, a key idea in the tradition of Goethe and Schiller and in the tradition of Jung as well. Does that obrigado, make sense? <laughs> obrigado vocês, obrigado Paul. Paul, é... Queria, queria mudar um pouco o foco da conversa e, e ir para a sua obra, para a sua produção. É, nós tivemos aqui no Teaços, no nosso projeto, é, a Lucy Huskisson, que escreveu um livro sobre Jung e Nietzsche. Hum. E tivemos a Gaia Domenici, que também acabou de lançar um livro hum. sobre Nietzsche, tomando o livro vermelho como uma possibilidade nova de interpretação. Ambas fazem menção ao teu livro, ao Selfie de Onizeco. Queria te perguntar é, qual foi a importância desse livro na tua obra e como é que você vê esse livro hoje junto a essas outras produções mais recentes desse tema Jung Nietzsche? Hum. Ok, that's a great, that's a great question. Uh, thank you. Um, now, I've, I've met Lucy Huskinson on, on, on a number of occasions um, uh, at various Jungian events that were, that were held in the, in, in the UK. Um, and I've met Di uh, Gaia Domenici um, only once. I think it was at a seminar down in, in, in London. So I, I was, I've, I've been pleased to meet these people um, at, at least once and in the case of, uh, of Lucy um, uh, several times. Um, and, and my view is, um, Jung and Nietzsche is such a big topic, the more the merrier. Um, I, I was lucky that I think, um, purely in terms of age and time, um, I, I was able to get at it as, um, uh, as one of the first people to do, uh, to do a, a, a book on it. Um, there was also um, someone called uh, Gerhard Schmidt in Finland, um, who was working on exactly the same topic. And he's written a book in German on, on Nietzsche and, and Jung. And he, he very kindly invited me over uh, 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 to give a paper. Um, and he told me that he was so annoyed when he saw that my book had come out, because it had come out just a few months before his had done. And I said, but I'm very sorry about that. I didn't know, but I think the more I think I think the topic of Jung and Nietzsche, um, like Goethe and Schiller and, and Jung, is so important. The more people who work on it, the better. What I like about Lucy Huskinson's um, approach uh, is that she investigates, um, one might say, the, the existential angle uh, of the question. What I like about uh, Gaia Dominici's approach is she has a big advantage, um, which I didn't have, or Gerhard Schmidt, or Lucy. We didn't have the Red Book. Um, and, and, and it was really pleasing, it was really pleasing to see um, a, a Gaia uh, fitting uh, this question of the, the Jung-Nietzsche relation into the Red Book. And to my mind, I think it's 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 clear that what what Zaratustra was for Nietzsche, the Red Book is is, is for Jung. 
And I think the, the Gaia de Medici very clearly brings out um, the, the deep Nietzschean motifs that are informing that work. And again, it's not to say that, that Jung is simply copying Nietzsche. Uh, Jung knows what Nietzsche has gone through. Um, and he's, he, he's, he's trying to do that. Um, I mean, he knows that Nietzsche goes mad and Jung doesn't want to go mad. So he tries to get in this work on the Red Book as a way of self-therapy, self-offering self-therapy uh, to, him, uh, to himself. Um, in Memories, Dreams, Reflections, there's this line where Jung says, I was really worried that I was going to be like Nietzsche. And you can see, I think, that Nietzsche was always going to be a problematic figure for Jung because Nietzsche had got it right in his diagnosis of society and psychology, but he got it wrong because he ended up going mad. And I think that Jung is trying to say, I want to understand Nietzsche's critique, but provide a solution. And I think that's, that comes in the form of their different approaches to the divine. Self-evidently for Nietzsche, uh, God is dead. That's, that's what the madman in the parable in um, the gay science says, although it's interesting that it's a madman who, who says it. So God is dead as far as Nietzsche is concerned. And what we find in the seven sermons in the Red Book is that he says, no, he's not dead. He's more alive than ever. And I think we can see there the way that, ne the, the way that Nietzsche provides a framework for Jung. And yet Jung is trying to provide a solution to the problem that he sees Nietzsche as having diagnosed. So I would describe, um, I would describe Jung as a post-Nietzschean thinker. And I think probably uh, Lucy Huskinson and Guy Domenici would agree with that assessment as well. Interessante, é uma, é uma bela interpretação. Pós Jung como um pensador pós-Nietzscheano, nesse sentido. Ótimo, ótimo. Bom, tem uma outra curiosidade que eu queria tirar contigo. É, nesse livro recém-lançado, sobre Jung e Lacan, também você escreve sobre Lacan, que é um autor que eu gosto muito. E você escreve um livro sobre Lacan e Jung e o Livro Vermelho. Inevitável te perguntar, como é que foi essa experiência? Como é que Lacan entra nessa... É, nesse grupo de autores. Qual é, tu, qual é a tua impressão sobre o pensamento lacaniano? Well, um, in, in part, it was um, because of the invitation from the uh, um, editors of the book who put on a, on a conference that got me thinking about um, the relations between Jung and, and Lacan. And, And I think it, it's something which is, which is why I so much like taking part in events like this evening is because meetings, conversations, conferences, you, you never know what's going to come out of them. It, it's always a great way for sparking thoughts. And um, it's one of the reasons why I like doing things like this. For me, the real link came by trying to work out what is the role of beauty in Jung, and what is the role of the sublime in Lacan? And um, what I was trying to do in that in that chapter, taking the Red Book as as a as a kind of case case study, was was to say um, the sublime because Lacan uh, works with an idea of the sublime, which he also takes from Schiller, as I point out. So 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 Schiller is is useful not just for Jung. But for, uh, but, but for Lacan and psychoanalysis in, in, in general, um, is, is that the sublime is always about um, exceeding, uh, going beyond uh, or never attaining. It, it's about an essential lack. And of course, Lacan is the psychoanalyst of lack, of insufficiency, of failure to integrate, failure to, to identify. Jung, by contrast, is a thinker of beauty where there is harmony, 
where there is agreement, where there is a, a coming together and integration. And that's why, to my mind, Jung is not a thinker of lack, uh, nor is he a thinker of, of excess. He's a thinker of, of just the right enough, of, of how to marry things together and how to hold them, um, not as something which is jammed together artificially, but as something which, which grows and, and, and is nurtured and, and flourishes. Um, and that's why for him, the symbol is so important. Yeah. Lacan does not have this concept of the symbol or the symbolic in the same way uh, that Jung does. Lacan is a thinker of the sign, Jung is a thinker of the symbol, and I think therefore this important tradition of, of the symbol marks out the difference between Jung as a symbolic thinker and Lacan as a semiotic thinker. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Perfeito, perfeito. Acho que essas, essas, essas conversas, essas interlocuções são sempre muito frutíferas, muito, muito proveitosas. Pessoal, temos, temos tempo para mais duas ou três perguntas, tá? Enquanto vocês pensam, pô, vou fazer mais uma, tá? É, vou ser um pouco freudiano agora. Queria, queria falar da Emily Jung. Oh, dear. É. É, é a mãe do Jung que apresenta Fausto para ele. E ele lê com 15 anos. E aí é engraçado que no Memórias, Sonhos e Reflexões... Ele, ele vai associar a, a mãe solar durante o dia e a mãe noturna, estranha, sombria à noite. E, e isso ele vai, de alguma maneira, depois associar com a personalidade 1, um, personalidade 2. Ele faz também referências a Fausto. Queria que você comentasse um pouco esse episódio. Qual é, qual é o lugar da mãe do Jung? Mãe do Jung, Fausto e o próprio Jung nisso. Como é que esse triângulo se organiza? Hum. Well, well, my, my goodness. Um, uh, uh, it's so hard to say anything about Jung's mother because, because none of us have ever, ever met her. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if we'd want to on the description that's, uh, that's given. But I, I think what Jung's trying to get at by uh, by telling the story about um, his mother saying you should read Faust, um, it is a way of and, and I think we should read Memories, Dreams, Reflections as a work which which has this very very complicated um, genesis um, it, it, in the same way that we should we should read the Bible, which is to say we don't look at is it literally true. We look at as as you know, what what is the symbolic truth um, in it. So you know, just as in the parable of the man who built his house on sand, it, it's a misunderstanding of the story to say, um, well, what sort of sand and what was the name of the man? That's not how the story works. And I think that when we're told that Jung's mother says you should read Faust these days, it's not about this is a historical truth. It's a way of him signalling something that he says later in his in his uh, in memories dreams reflections about faust was that he was interested with the figure of the mothers and i think this idea of well it was my mother who said you should read faust is a way of emphasizing this theme of the mothers mm -hmm. um which takes us all the way to um to part two of faust and the the whole question of the descent um down to the realm of the mothers um with the aid of uh, mephisto or with the aid of this key that he's given by uh, by mephisto um, I don't think I'm dodging the question because I don't think we have enough information um, to know um, what on earth was going on with Jung's, uh, with, with Jung's mother. Um, and of course, this very difficult domestic situation that he grows up in, uh, the mother with her two personalities, the father who seems to be very depressed, has lost his faith. Um, uh, it, 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 and there's this line where he talks about memories, dreams, reflections. He says that at night, mother became mysterious, mother became un unheimlich. Um, and and what one can only wonder, what, just, just what on earth was that, uh, what, what was that about? It's worthwhile saying that, that Goethe has a, a very positive view of his, of, of his own mother, 
um, but who is also presented as a kind of larger than life uh, uh, figure than so on. Um, and I can't help thinking that, um, I mean, you mentioned Freud. On, on a Freudian level, it all comes back to the personal and, and the psychological. And, and I do sometimes wonder how, how we should read that line, which comes right at the end of um, Collected Works 5, uh, Symbols of Transformation, where there's a moment where, where Jung says, and I wonder what he means by it, Jung says, the only person who ever understands us is the mother. Oh. <laughs> Paul, o título Memórias. <laughs> you ask the question. Antes não ter nascido, antes não ter nascido. É... O título Memórias, Sonhos e Reflexões. O Jung pega emprestado de Goethe, de um, de um, de um livro de Goethe, de um capítulo, de um texto de Goethe. Você faz uma referência disso em algum livro. Você lembra? Yeah, he is uh, uh, he is playing on a on, on a formula that one finds with Goethe, but uh, but I think it I think it's also it's also playing on this this idea uh, that we touched on earlier um, about Dichtung uh, und Wahrheit, poetry and truth, and and Goethe's biography is 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 going is going to be both, um, and I know there's a very complicated history of 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 the genesis. Of how memories, dreams, reflections comes comes to be to be written, um, but, but for me, I think the clue to it lies all in those those opening pages um, when when um, uh, when Jung says in in, in his book, um, "My life is a story of the self-realization of the unconscious." He says it's about myth. Myth, he says, um, is what really matters. The only question is whether what I tell is my fable, my truth. And I think that's, that's where we get this idea of playing with Dichtung uh, on, uh, on Wahrheit that you're, that you're talking about. Um, and, and as he goes on to, uh, to talk about it, it's very clear that he's not offering a kind of conventional uh, biography. He's offering something which is symbolic um, he, he's trying to describe how in Goethean terms he, he comes to be who he is. And I think that the Dichtung und Wahrheit is, is a very different kind of book because it's solo authored by, uh, by Goethe, as opposed to Memories, Dreams, Reflections, where you have this important input by, by Angela Jaffe. But it is interesting that for large parts of uh, Dichtung und Wahrheit, Goethe talks about himself in the third person. So, so he presents it as if he were narrating someone else's life. And, and that seems to me is a, is a similar kind of move to what we find happening in Memories, Dreams, Reflections. Interessante. Bom, oh, é, nosso tempo foi duas horas. São seis horas da tarde aqui, dez horas da noite em Glasgow. Acho que sim, não? Queria... It's queria 10 fazer... o'clock. It's dark outside. <risos> vou, vou me atrever a fazer a última pergunta. A última. É... Yeah. Eu, eu não me lembro exatamente aonde eu, aonde eu li ou, ou em alguma aula no YouTube sua que você diz que a, o pensa, a psicologia junguiana ela não cabe não somente, não apenas dentro de um método terapêutico e ela não cabe também dentro de tão somente uma teoria psicológica. O que, que é, então? Qual é o lugar, então, da psicologia junguiana para você? Na cultura, né? Por assim dizer. In a, in a culture. Yeah. Um, well, I think I think I would see it now as as having a very important function um, as uh, not just a therapy, but as a way of mediating cultural tradition 
um, to, to, to society, uh, to, to, to young people, to, to, to keeping culture and tradition uh, alive. Um, I, I'm not sure that our schools and universities um, really do that as much as they could. Um, and that's not a problem if you're a Jungian, because you've got this great set of 20 volumes of the collected works, which are chock full of culture, chock full of art history, chock full of literary history, architecture, philosophy, fascinating. You learn so much, you learn so much through the collected work uh, of Jung. And so I would say one of the things that analytical psychology is at the moment is, is a great course in what the Germans called Bildung, education, culture of connecting with the past, not just as something which is of antique interest, but as something which is alive and present. Mm -hmm. and, and for me, that great opening line that one finds in Jung's first book, Transformations and Symbols of the Libido, summarizes what he's all about, is that as you're going around in a modern city, you come across a little piece of a temple or a little statue or a little pillar or column or something, and you realize that the hustle and bustle of the city that's there now was there centuries or millennia before you, and that we are connected with the past. And I think that Jung is, is a beautiful thinker for helping us connect with the past as a way of thinking about the future. Ótimo. Muito obrigado, Paul. Muito obrigado. Quero te agradecer a tua generosidade, a tua disponibilidade para estar aqui com a gente. Te agradecer em nome do Tiaços, da Isa, da Luciana, mas particularmente quero agradecer no meu nome, na justa medida em que eu sou um leitor teu de muitos anos. E para mim é uma grande alegria ter você tão perto da gente hoje, trazendo suas ideias, seus livros, seu pensamento. Para nós é um grande orgulho, uma grande satisfação te receber. Espero que a gente possa nos revermos em breve, pessoalmente, e que o mundo, o campo junguiano brasileiro se aproxime cada vez mais do seu pensamento. Muito obrigado, Paul. Deixo com você as palavras finais. Well, thank, thank you very much. It's, it's very kind of you to invite me. It, it's very nice to know that I have at least one reader. Um, that's really very encouraging and very reassuring. Um, it, it's been a great way to, to start the weekend. Um, I hope you all have a great weekend too. Um, thank you for your questions. Uh, thank you for listening. Um, and uh, yes, let's hope that one day soon we can, we can get to travel around the world again. Um, and I look forward to uh, meeting as many of you as I can in person. That would be great. Thank you so much. Um, it's been a great time for me. So thank you and good night.